We don't stick our heads in the sand when the times are tough. We actually rise up, educate ourselves, and you know, do what we need to do to strengthen our community and strengthen our families. So I appreciate y'all for, for uh, being here and uh, being involved here, no matter how uncomfortable the topics are. I want to let you know a couple of housekeeping bits. You can see the um, bright green exit signs. The main exits are obviously to your right, to my left. In case of an uh, emergency, we also have exits back this way. The restrooms are out here are. by the open doors to the right. Yeah, okay. And snacks, you probably figured that one out already. Snacks are through the open doors right back that way. We don't have any break scheduled. It's a tight agenda. We have no break schedule. If you need to, please feel free to stand up, stretch, do what you need to do. Take care of yourselves as we take care of you. You'll notice in your packets there are, well, they're not three by five. We have uh, index cards in there, whatever size you would call that, four by six. We won't have time to be able to answer questions on the fly, but we do know that your questions are important. We want to go ahead and get to as many as we can. So throughout the evening, if you have a question, be sure and write it down. And Jeremiah, by the door, give, give us a wave. That's Jeremiah. So Jeremiah will be uh, collecting those. Just give his attention. He'll be keeping an eye out for you. Just raise your hand up. Um, that they can be anonymous, of course. The questions um, we're going to try to answer toward the end of the program, and those questions, especially the urgent ones uh, that have a broad um, reach, we're going to make sure that they're on the RaisingClasser.org website. Correct? Okay. There's a uh, saying that it takes a village to raise a child, and it's actually a beautiful saying because there's no one family, there's no one parent, there's not even any one school that should feel obligated to do it all by themselves. And that's why I love this county, I love the network that we belong, with, we belong to, that includes the schools, the faith-based organizations, the nonprofits, certainly the counties, the school districts. We all come together in this county so well to work together to support each other, to support our families and our communities. Some of them are here with us tonight. I want to take a second to acknowledge Community Recovery Resources. Give us a wave in the back. <laughs> Wellness Together is just outside the lobby, but that's where Jeremiah works. Give us a wave again. I'll get back to you. My personal favorite, partially because they pay me twice a month, is back in that corner right there, Kids First and Art. The Teen Illusion Council, is anybody here from the LLC? Okay, they're obviously a, a big player in, uh, in this uh, network of support for our families. The uh, Placer uh, County Network of Care. Actually, this way back. Placer, office, uh, Placer County Office of Education, as well as the uh, Native Youth Services are here in support. And just a couple more, we have Coalition for Rockland Youth right over here. City of Rockland Police Department, always a great support. So Is there a cop in the house? He's here, oh, he's, he's out in the lobby. Yeah, I've seen him walking around. We also have, of course, the uh, Rockland Unified School District. They've been super supportive as a special thanks I need to give to the Rockland Unified School District Board of Trustees for their guidance and their care and their support and leadership. So please, give them a round of applause. Before I introduce um, the first presenter, I'm just going to go off script here just for a minute to let you know that I've been in one-on-one -on -one meetings with many of these people uh, in, that are here and that also that are not here. I've been in small group meetings. I've been in large group meetings. I've been in open door meetings. I've been in closed door meetings. And the one constant that I see in every single one of these meetings is that they care. They absolutely care about this county. They care about this community. They care about their schools. They care about their families. They care about you. And you might be saying, well, that's easy for you to say, Mike, you're part of the network. I put my money where my mouth is. I worked in this network for about three years. I, I, I commuted in from four counties. And I woke up one morning and said, you know what? I don't just want to work here anymore. And I literally, one day, woke up, talked to my kids. I'm a single father of two. Talked to my kids. Talked to a real estate agent. 
actually two, one in Naomi County, one in Placer County, and made that decision right then and there to move here. So a year ago, I moved, uh, rather than commuting in from four counties, I lived just a couple miles down the street, so I want to let you know that's how much faith I have as to the, the level of care and commitment that this county, the people that serve, uh, serve you and serve this county, they want richer communities, they want strong families, they want you to be happy, healthy, and whole. I want to give a round of applause to all of them. Tonight, these are a few things you should expect. And I'm gonna test my neck flexibility here. Learn uh, local trends, signs, and symptoms of youth substance use. Increase awareness of the risk of substance use and student mental health. Further understand the connection between stress and substance use. And acquire knowledge for increasing resiliency in our youth and community. These are some of the uh, facilitators you're gonna be hearing from tonight, including, as you can tell, we're gonna have a little round table and a uh, fireside chat. And the first presenter tonight I'd like to call up is Christina Vazes. for being here and just really, really grateful again, like Mike said, for this county and all the collaborations that we do. I have so many collaborator friends and partners in the room here, so grateful. And um, my original background, I'm the director for the Coalition for Placer Youth and we serve um, primarily Rockland now, so we're the Coalition for Rockland Youth, but we use both of those names. We're, we're going through branding changing right now, so bear with us on that. Um, but my background, my original training was in stress management and biofeedback. So through years of training, I really learned the impact of stress on mental health and wellness. And so then when I moved into substance use prevention, it was really easy for me to see that there's so much connection there to these things. And um, it's, it's really important for us to acknowledge that we have, that these changes go on, and there's subtle changes that go on that we might not even be aware of, like maybe increased caffeine intake in our children that shows that they're maybe having some problems sleeping, and they're trying to compensate. That can be an early symptom, so part of my work, I'm kind of hypersensitive to those little things, and we hope after tonight you guys will get some good information that you can um, collect with you, and we have our folders here with all sorts of great stuff as well. Our coalition is a federally funded um, drug free communities coalition. We are in our last two years of funding here in Rockland, and it's very important that we keep collaborating. We're always looking for people to join our leadership team, volunteer, um, be the parent voice, the youth voice, help us with our strategies in the community because we intend to continue on even after the funding is gone. We've already established a lot of really good strategies in the CAD, um, in Rockland to help continue that. Our vision is to have a healthy Rockland community free of youth substance use, where you feel valued and supported. And I think that's really critical, valued and supported. And I think there's so many different pieces to that. And tonight you're gonna to see some ups and downs. We're gonna look at challenges, we're gonna look at solutions and opportunities. And so it's really important that you um, bear with us and look at different things and hopefully you'll go home inspired tonight. What we do is, sometimes people wonder, what do you do? Well, we have a lot of different strategies. We do evenings like this tonight. Um, really important. We really like to work with parents because we know it starts at the, in the home. But we also work with educators. We have a quarterly newsletter and we do a lot of different work that's important. And we also have our wonderful updated new Placer County, um, excuse me, um, coalition for Placer County web, it's called raisingplacer.org. So again, bear with me with the branding. So now we have, you guys can go to the website, raisingplacer.org, and you can see the collaboration of other um, community DFCs 
and all the new information that we have. <laughs> and another thing that we do is we, um, we help work on policy changes in the community that help support parents and support our youth to have a healthier place to live. Has anybody heard of the Social Host Ordinance? If you have, can you raise your hand? Thank you. For those of you who haven't, there's a little um, door hanger in your folder. And this is, um, it's, it's not a criminal um, problem. It's, it's, it's basically what this is, this holds parents or adults um, accountable for um, those who might provide alcohol, marijuana, or other controlled substances to in the home or in for an underage drinking party or a party for youth. So, but it's not just that, it's actually a tool for parents because parents need help too. So it's nice to say, you know what, this is not okay, I don't support this, we know this is not okay. So it's a tool for parents as well. And that's some of the things that we've done. We've also worked closely with the cities and the county board of supervisors to help educate them on some of the marijuana um, risks and harms that we'll be talking about later on so that they are able to make the best policy decisions. And we also look at our, um, the trends that are going on in Rockland and the surrounding communities. And so from our 2015 school survey, what we um, found was that there's, even though the use rates right now in Rockland are fairly low compared to some of the other surrounding areas in California and across the country, there are some big leaps between 9th and 11th graders. And so I really want you to just kind of take that home because one of the things that we found from our um, survey data as well is that the students reported that their parents hadn't talked to them as frequently in the 11th grade about the risks of drugs and alcohol that they did in 9th grade. So not only do they have more pressures, they're not getting those conversations. Or if they are, they're not resonating with them. So those are that was kind of a takeaway from this. And just looking at um, marijuana use, um, age of first use, 14.3 years. That's concerning. Um, and alcohol, 13.7, so even a year earlier. So why does this matter? Well, stress and um, substance use and mental health. This is, this is kind of like my, the most important conversation that I really like to bring home because I think there's so much information here on top of all the text too. <laughs> um, I'll bring it, I'll make it easy. One of, our, one of the things that we were able to do last year with our, some of our um, extra evaluation dollars is we looked at student use rates that reported binge drinking to find out what was going on with them. And we were able to see that there was definitely a correlation between the um, feeling stressed and always stressed and binge drinking in the last 30 days. So that was very concerning. Um, there was also a student that actually said was pretty clear. We did a youth focus group earlier this year. And the quote is, I know certain friends who try to be high achieving and they just drive themselves crazy with stress, uh, the stress of trying to be at the top. And then they go drinking. It's the stress of the environment that drives part of the drinking. So the kids understand this. You know, they, they know that this is part of their coping mechanism, not for all students, but for some. And then the stress and marijuana use that we looked at um, showed higher mean scores in stress related to family, sadness, loneliness, um, money pressure, the use of drugs and alcohol, and personal mental health than those students had not that had not reported using marijuana. And these are some indicators that even though we are an affluent community by a lot of standards, um, there everybody isn't like that. Everybody doesn't have access to the resources to keep up with the other students. And I think it's so important for us to be mindful that we have to make sure that our own children, if they do have those opportunities, are accepting and not and sensitive to the pressures that other families might be having in the community. And so those um, might be indicators of some of those youth use rates. So we know that sustained levels of stress change the brain chemistry, 
increase anxiety and depression and can increase substance use, including prescription medications. So this is, could be another indicator of why the abuse rates from between ninth and 11th graders go up. And this is concerning because the brain is still developing. Has anybody read The Teen Brain? You have raised your hand. Okay. It's a wonderful book where you can hear interviews online. Um, talks about the brain chemistry, highly recommended. It's such an important window into what's going on with our students, our children up to age 25, and how the brain is developing and why this impacts addiction rates later on in life that we'll be um, talking about later on. So, one of the, the other things we have, um, so when you're thinking about the brain and the impact of the brain and chemicals and um, substances and how that might affect, you have to think about what are the access to these things. And we do know that it is pretty clear that when you increase access, use rates also increase. And that's why our coalition's been working diligently to communicate to our legislators, our local um, bodies, to make sure that they're aware of that, that we want to protect our communities. And the data is very clear, and there's new data coming out of Colorado now, too. Um, I just learned about again today, but I think we all kind of knew this that are in prevention, that the communities that did not allow um, dispensaries, those use rate, the youth use rates are way down, much lower. So we know that when you increase the access, you increase the um, use rates and the product trends. So with edibles coming into California, um, we have to be concerned about this. And the California state has their governing um, body that is working on the, the cannabis regulations that are pretty strict but there still is going to be edibles and um, drinkable marijuana, THC. THC is the psychoactive compound in um, marijuana that we'll be hearing more about in just a minute. But 10 milligrams per dose is what California is going to be calling a single dose. And these drinks that are single-use drinks that are the big, you know, like energy drinks, some of these have 250 milligrams. Um, and then the packaging, the edibles of the foods as well. And then we also have great, oops, that's a little dark there, but that's, that's actually a pen. And we have different forms of using um, marijuana and cannabis products, whether they're for medicinal or not. We're talking about youth now, and it's very easy for them to use cannabis with um, vape pens, and it's odorless and undetectable, so you can't even tell. And then there's also vaporizers. So there's a lot of new products, and there's always going to be something new. So the real, the real takeaway is to make sure that we know that our students um, are getting the support that they need, that they're getting the, 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 the support that they need to be able to move forward and get resources to deal with the stress of their lives, and that we talk to them about these things. And then there's the butane hash oil, the honey oil, that is um, known as dabs or shatter or wax, and this is a high, high concentrate. So when you're using it and you're developing a tolerance, you're going to go for a, a more um, intense product, and this is, can really lead to um, addictions. So there's a lot of different products we just want to be aware of. And so when you, if you look at the word oil, then you turn it upside down, you have a number. And so this becomes a form of coded marketing in clothing and um, hats and wear and whatever. So there's all sorts of really clever coded clothing and different paraphernalia that um, accessories that people in the industry know about. But one of the main things about this, too, is when all of this becomes more accessible, more common in our culture, and we're going to see this in California even more so, um, the percep perception of harm goes down. So the more you think, I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard of um, it's natural, 
Anybody heard that? And um, it's safer than alcohol. Heard that. And no one has ever died from smoking pot. Those are the three things that I hear a lot. And um, we can refute all of those. It's not natural. It's been genetically modified to be stronger and more potent now. It's not what it used to be. Um, it's ha and because of that, there's a lot more risk to it. And now, impaired driving is a big, big concern for us. So it is, people can die. And so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna show a very short DVD um, film for you all to be aware of um, what's going on and why it should matter so that you can have the really accurate, reliable information for these talking points. And then we're gonna come back and talk about some good stuff and then we have a wonderful panel. Thanks, uh, Christina, for right there, working for a coalition of Placer youth and uh, rebranded as Coalition for Rockland Youth. Uh, she does amazing work, as does the next young lady I'm going to invite up here. She has a title very long and very impressive, and she just wants to be called a social worker for PCOE. She's an amazing resource, a very caring person, and we're going to change the pace up a little bit for you by inviting Alicia Rosema. Even if they're 18, 
At age 18, that prefrontal cortex, that thinking brain, is only about halfway through its development. So there is a lot of opportunity for us as caring adults in kids' lives to promote healthy development. We have a lot of work to do and a lot of influence in the trajectory of our kiddos' lives. So with that, I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about something called the 40 Developmental Assets. And there is a handout. I think it's purple in your packet, as my son would say, purple, purple. And the 40 Developmental Assets is something that I've um, worked with and known about um, throughout my years as a school social worker. They were developed and researched by an organization called the Search Institute, which I'll talk a little bit about now, but we're going to dive into a little bit more later. But what I want you to know is that there's tons of research behind these assets with hundreds of thousands of kids across the United States in diverse communities. So this is not one of those research studies that happened in one small, you know, Eurocentric community in one um, state. This has been done nationwide with kids from age 6 through 12th grade. So there's a lot of um, good research and good evidence behind what I'm about to share. The Search Institute has developed two kind of big categories of assets, internal and external. So external is more, what are the strengths that we want to build upon and promote in a young person's school, in their community, in their general environment? And internal is more individual strengths within a young person's personality, their temperament, their mental health, their behavior, and their choices. So again, it's really important to not think of internal as fixed, right? They're still developing. We have a lot of influence on supporting the positive internal assets among young people in our lives. The categories of the assets, external support, empowerment, boundaries and expectations, and constructive use of time. And then the categories of internal are commitment to learning, positive values, social competencies, and positive identity. And you can see on your sheet that it kind of takes those 40 assets and chunks them into those eight categories. So what does the research say? In general, the more assets that a young person has, the more likely they are to do well in school, the less likely they are to give up when things get difficult, right, that resilience. They're more likely to pay attention to healthy eating and exercise, because we care about the physical development of young people as well, right? We want them to choose healthy foods. We want them to be physically active. This is cool. The more assets that they have, the more likely they are able to demonstrate the ability to save money. So that's kind of delaying gratification, right? I'm going to save up for this thing that is more important than spending my money willy-nilly. Um, they have more values around believing that diversity is important. So it's important to know people of different ethnic and racial backgrounds. <coughs> they're more likely to have leadership experience, and they're more likely to have time management skills. So those are just some of the research findings. The greater assets, the greater these experiences. In addition, the more assets that a young person has, the less likely they are to abuse alcohol and other drugs. The less likely they are to engage in behavior that would risk involvement in the juvenile justice system. They have more positive mental health outcomes. So greater assets, lower risk of depression, lower risk of anxiety, lower risk of thoughts of suicide. And finally, less likely to engage in early sexual behavior with multiple partners. So what can we do to promote the development of assets and teens? My watch is all, I already, I blew through my seven minutes and I'm already talked over. So I'm gonna go through this really quickly. But what I really want to point out is that
that if you go to the Search Institute's website, you can click on any of the assets there, and it'll give you a little drop-down menu of ideas about how you, as a parent, as a caring adult in a young person's life, can help promote that asset. We're gonna do an activity later where that's gonna be really important. But for example, if you wanna support the asset of family boundaries, one idea they promote is keeping devices in the common area of the home and away from the bedrooms. So I think that Wellness Together gave that great example the last time we were all together a couple months ago, but that you have a basket in the living room and that's where everyone's phone, including yours, goes in the evening when you're headed to bed, not into the bedroom. Another example here is if you want to promote resistance skills, reinforce nonviolent resistance skills like walking away, assertiveness, and asking for adult help. So an idea might be to take that incredible video that we just watched and sit down with your kids, even if they're complaining and moaning and groaning, and watch it with them. And then have a conversation with them about it. What did you think? How are you actively engaging resistance skills right now? The last thing I want to say in my last moment is that, you know, the 40 developmental assets does not just look at parent-child relationships. It looks at the importance of young people having relationships with other positive caring adults in their lives. Adults at school, adults in their community, adults in the neighborhood, adults in their community of faith in particular. You also have a role potentially to be that caring adult for another young person in Placer County and in Rockland. Your children's friends, young people that you encounter in your neighborhood or in your daily lives, we all have the potential to be a positive caring adult in a young person's life. You know, one of my roles at PCOE is helping to coordinate foster youth services. And we have on any given day um, just over 250 foster youth throughout Placer County. So think about how important it is for those young people who are not currently in the care of their parents to have a positive adult role model in their life. So we're going to pause it here and I'm going to turn it over to the C Deputy CEO of CORE, Ariel Love. Thank you and good evening everyone. Gosh, I commend you all for um, coming out tonight um, as well as working with CORE. I'm a mom of two. My daughter Lyndon is almost 15 and my son Zephyr is 13. So like you were in the thick of it and it is hard to get out as well as really wanting to honor the school district for promoting this. I think it's awesome that we're um, all here tonight. So quickly before I have the honor of introducing the panel, I just want to share a little bit of um, context around substance use disorder. Community Recovery Resources, my organization is the primary nonprofit provider of substance use disorder treatment services throughout Placer County as well as Nevada County. And that includes services for teens and adults. So, you know, what we know here in the United States, substance use disorder is one of the more challenging chronic diseases we face as a nation today. About one in 10 Americans experience substance use disorder. This chronic disease costs our nation more than cancer and diabetes combined. And we know that substance use disorders touch every aspect of individual, family, and community life. We also know that nine out of 10, or 90% of Americans who do experience a substance use disorder begin their use in their childhood and teen years. So that's pretty profound when we think about that. And um, you know, both Christina and Alicia did a great job helping us contextualize why that is in terms of adolescent brain development. Our human adolescent brains are at a risky time for developing a substance use disorder because, as we should be, we're exploring new things, but also our brains, as they're developing their circuitry, their wiring, are prone to getting that wiring derailed by substance use. So, um, you know, and this, and this other, which is why this bottom statistic is so important, is the um, highly increased risk of developing a substance use disorder or addiction when onset is in the teenage years or, or before. So, you know, that's really why we're here tonight. Um, I think the good news is that, 
just wanting to mention two things, you know, one is that treatment and intervention work, and so there's a lot of hope as well, and we'll hear a little bit about that later tonight. But also, I wanna emphasize that most kids aren't. Christina shared some good statistics, and I think as parents, one thing that is important to talk about too is that, you know, like the young woman in the video said, everybody in Colorado is doing it. Truly, they're not, right? There's a lot of kids that aren't. So being able to have that conversation with our kids too is that it's not inevitable. So if folks are experiencing use, misuse, abuse, addiction, help, early intervention, prevention, treatment can help, so there's that hope, and then also there's the possibility that, you know, not taking it as a given that this has to be part of um, development. So, really quickly, Cora, I'm gonna blast through these, but just wanting folks to know what resources are available. We have a full spectrum of services from prevention through intensive treatment, aftercare, housing, residential treatment for adults. I'm gonna hone in on our adolescent services. The Student Assistance Program is a program where our um, substance use disorder treatment counselors and or therapists are on site at about 18 or 19 schools throughout Nevada and Placer County, being able to provide early intervention and to support to students. The, and then adolescent outpatient treatment is available um, most closely to here at our site in Roseville, also Auburn, and then also throughout. Nevada County as well, with substance use disorder treatment counselors providing evidence-based treatment to, to teens at varying levels. And then also touching on a great program that we're able to offer in partnership with Placer County and the Mental Health Services Act, where we can really provide no barrier individualized support for emerging mental illness and or substance use disorders for adolescents and their families, and this is really um, the opportunity for individualized support around these issues that our team of both certified substance use disorder treatment counselors and licensed marriage and family therapists can work with that um, student and that family to address what is coming up. And then also, I should mention the parent project, but anyway, Forest Youth is back there. You can ask questions. I wanna make sure to get to our panel. Oh, and these are a few of the evidence-based treatment. You know, I think that one thing I hear when I go out in communities is that folks don't know what's available or what is treatment, are we just gonna sit around and chat? But I think, you know, we've heard a lot about how substance use and specifically marijuana has changed. Also, our treatment has changed. And we have a lot more tools, I think, than uh, we did maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. Really having interventions that can, um, are evidence-based and effective in supporting that kind of behavioral change, giving young people, and adults, but we're talking about young people, but giving our young people the tools that they need to be successful. So when we were asked to come share tonight, um, which we're really honored to do, we thought, what better way than really being able to offer some diverse perspectives. So it's my honor to introduce our panel, and I will hopefully, um, you folks can come up as I'm introducing you. So in no particular order, we have uh, Randy Rodriguez is a parent. He transitioned from being a finance and tech attorney in the Bay Area to a government attorney in Sacramento in order to create the work-life balance um, to become an alcohol and drug counselor, which is his current interest. And Randy has a son in recovery. We also have Stephanie Sadu who is um, with Community Recovery Resources. She's a certified alcohol and drug counselor who facilitates our parent project classes. She also provides services on school campuses. And Stephanie is also the parent of a 15-year-old. I think it's her daughter's birthday tomorrow. Yes. Um, and let's see, we also have, we have Jacob. He's 18 years old and a senior at a local high school. He plans to go to college and focus on the profession of a substance use disorder counselor and to serve in the correction field working with both adults and teens. We also have Kyle. He's 18 and a high school graduate attending a local junior college and Kyle is majoring in kinesiology and looks forward to a career as a high school teacher and basketball coach. We also are glad to have with us tonight Mark Egger. He's a senior deputy probation officer with Placer County, and he's currently assigned to the juvenile supervision unit and is the co-coordinator of the juvenile drug court program. Oh, here we, okay, and then um, also we have Nancy Taylor. Nancy is a licensed marriage and family therapist who currently oversees CORE's substance use disorder and mental health services for Placer County, including our adolescent services. Now let's give the whole panel. So we'll be 
Um, and as a reminder, if anyone has questions, if anyone has questions that you want to write down on your index cards and pass to the staff that are um, receiving those, we'll be answering those if there are questions toward the end of this session. So I'll be keeping track of the time, helping support in that way, and we'll start with um, some questions to our panel. Thanks again to everyone who is here tonight. So our first question, um, just kind of digging right in, what should parents say when their teen asks them if they've ever used drugs? And kind of a part two, how do you talk to young people about legal drugs, alcohol, marijuana, and prescription drugs? I guess I'll start. Um, what you guys should focus on is not attacking them as well as like, have you done drugs or what drugs are you doing? It's more of like, and you don't want to try to get it out of them and, and, and lie and deceive them because it's, you, you need trust with your kid. And uh, so what I would focus on is like, what are the drugs, like you would ask them questions like, um, you know, what are the drugs kids are doing nowadays? Have you been exposed to those drugs? Instead of, you know, are you doing these drugs? Um, that's what I would focus on. I totally agree with Jacob. I think the main thing is just being honest. Don't be afraid to have that conversation and let them know that maybe you have experienced it. Um, I wouldn't glorify it, but definitely letting them know that yes, this is what I've taken, this is what I've done, but these are the negative consequences, and this is why I stopped and I didn't continue. Sort of along that line, um, two things that were mentioned before were just don't judge. Uh, sometimes if you have to, maybe practice in the mirror before you have that conversation so that you don't win since they say yes, I can use you or not. Uh, but don't judge. Uh, as soon as you do, they're gonna start to shut down a bit. You don't want that. You want the conversation to go forward. And then also build the trust. You don't have to get to the very end of the conversation right at the first question. Build the trust. I want to emphasize um, two things right there. One is just as you're listening, you know, not everything's going to resonate, but hopefully be paying attention to those nuggets that you can take home and remembering that not every conversation is going to go perfectly. You know, sometimes we have um, those conversations. My daughter's like, hey, are you trying something on me? And I'm like, yeah, but, but you know, she knows that I'm caring and I'm trying and I'm going to try in another way. And one um, important data piece that we know is that Parents are, even if it doesn't feel like it, we're still the greatest influencers on our children. This is, you know, research-based, and so there's a great talk they hear you campaign. So just, you know, plow forth, even if it's a little uncomfortable, and as, as you've said, in a non-judgmental way, we're not doing harm, but, you know, we're not gonna maybe get it perfect every time, but just trying to look for those, those opportunities. Um, did anyone wanna say or we can move on to the next one? I think it's also important to educate yourself. Um, as I think we saw in the film and heard people say, drugs are different now. And basing your discussion with them on what it was like in the past or uh, even a few years ago is not really gonna be realistic for their experience. I also think any opportunity that you talk to them is an opportunity to talk about your family values. Um, and that any conversation you have with them is not one conversation, but one of many conversations. Um, and looking for the opportunity when you see something on TV or hear a song to bring it up and talk about it a little bit and get their opinion. Great, and um, what can parents do to help a teen who is angry, closed off, or stressed out? I would, I would say first and foremost, uh, and I'm not trying to be zen, but seek uh, first to understand and then, and then to be understood. So what I mean by that is this. Uh, I've been a probation officer now for roughly 14 years. Very interesting when I am introduced to a new family that's been ordered into probation. And uh, the first thing I'll do is engage the youth that's on probation. It's very interesting. There's a good chunk of parents that will sit there and allow me to do that and, and, and ask questions and listen to the answers. 
But there's a vast majority of parents that interrupt and try to speak for the youth. And again, it's my first encounter, so I try to keep it as light as possible. But a lot of times, uh, the parent, in my mind, sounds like nails on a chalkboard. And I can only imagine how that youth feels as well. And so, you know, I try to, to stress my officers, we're not here to shame these kids. We want to be supportive. And, and, and really the best way you can do that is to have that rapport building, that one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, if it's a matter of, of, you know, for instance, with a parent and their youth, their child, you know, setting, setting aside that time where there's no outside distractions, uh, you know, turning the TV off, putting the cell phones away, whatever, whatever it takes. But as a parent, listen, listen to what's being said. Uh, and don't judge what's what's being said. Um, try to qualify every answer that's coming out of their mouth and, and try to coach them through it. But, but try to read between the lines and see what's going on. Um, as a team who was pretty much closed off to a lot of things, just don't try and pry and try to get what you want of, you, you know, what answer you're looking for. But give them a little space, give them a little time. And, you know, once they feel comfortable, they'll open up to you in the way you want. That's what I've noticed with me and my mom that would work best. He said exactly what, uh, what was I was going to say. So. <laughs> I have to agree with all of you. I think it's timing. I mean, you and I spoke yesterday about um, not feeling rushed or pushed or bombarded. But knowing that you, by listening to your child and knowing um, there are different actions every single day and being involved in their life, you know when something is wrong. And maybe you can't approach them at that exact moment, but finding the right time, maybe not the same day, but maybe a couple of days later, and asking, like, hey, what was going on that day? Or what happened? I noticed a difference in your attitude or your demeanor. And um, being empathetic about it. I think for me, two really important things. One is kids will look at what you do a whole lot more than what you say. So you got to model it. If you tell them all these grandiose things but you don't model it, they're not listening to what you're telling them. They're listening to what you're doing. Second thing is look for those outlets. I mean, God, when I grew up, and this was, um, this, was this, this area, I mean, we lived in the Bay Area for about 30, 35 years. But when I was here, if I got bored, I got on the motorcycle and I was off. Believe it or not, I could actually on my sleep on the motorcycle, brought my shotgun, go out and go bird, you know, go uh, other hunting, and no one cared. You can't do that now. Um, I would go out and we just do pick up football, just pick up football, pick up basketball. Um, so give them an outlet to burn that energy. That's the second thing. Find a way to let them burn that energy up because they have it. I also want to say that what you provide at home needs to be as much of a peaceful, safe, secure place as possible. And that means you need to co-parent well, um, even if you're not together anymore. I think a lot of the stress that we see kids carry is the fact that their parents who are divorced are not getting along and they feel that. Um, and I think that also there's a wonderful book and it's on the table. I brought some books that I think are, are really good. And one of them is Parenting from the Inside Out. And what that means is you bring to your parenting the experiences you had as a child too. And that can be good and bad. And so the work that you do to make yourself healthy and whole and strong and healed will make yourself a better parent. Here's a really specific one um, that I think a lot of us wonder about is, is kind of that balance between supervision and freedom. So do you think that checking texts, Instagram, Snapchat, um, do you think that is an invasion of privacy or a smart approach? See, that's a hard one. Uh, I'm obviously an 18 year old, but um, I think that it is necessary sometimes to definitely see what your kid is up to. Um, 
but like I said earlier, you don't want to attack them. You don't want to say, give me your phone, I'm going through it. Um, you want to just, you want to approach it as easy as possible and let them know that it's just for their own good and that you just have their interests in mind. Um, because, you know, you don't, want, you don't want your kid to feel like they can't trust you, that you're just attacking them or trying to punish them. Because the worst thing that you can do to somebody or a kid that is going through something like drug use is, is punish them and attack them because they'll skip further into it. But, uh, so for this one, I think sometimes it is necessary, but I think you shouldn't just do it out of nowhere. I think certain behaviors point you toward that route and you have to take it in order to do what's best for your kid. I think that's it's okay if you need it, if it needs to be done, but if not, then I wouldn't do it. I, so I do the parent project and this comes up all the time. And I think we have to get out of the mindset of supervision and trust are two different things. Um, trust, right? We love our kids and want to trust them. But supervising them and knowing what they're doing and being aware of where they are, um, and a great analogy that I use, you know, with my husband and my daughter, is if I go to a friend's house or have dinner, I would absolutely let him know. I would never just leave and not say. And it's basically the same thing. We want to know where they're at, know that they're safe, and um, a lot of times our teens will. Like my daughter manipulating me, like, well, don't trust me. I'm going to be home at this time. Um, but it is different. It's, um, yes, I trust you. Yes, I love you. Yes, I want you to be safe. But I need to know where you're going to be at. I need to know what you're doing on social media. Um, and it's OK. It really is OK to have that conversation. We pay for the cell phones most of the time um, and their social media. And it's OK to be their friends. And sometimes also, uh, it's not controlling their things. It's um, not controlling them, but controlling their things. And so if we provide them with um, laptops and their cell phones, it is definitely absolutely OK to, to make sure that they're safe. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, one of the things is to give them enough ability to exercise new skills without being too injured, too hurt, too bruised. But you want to give them some some ability to test their skills so that they can develop those skills. So you don't want to hover over them and be a helicopter parent. You want to give them some freedom to develop those skills within a safe environment. But as far as, and I'm a lawyer, so I guess, is it invasion of privacy? You bet it is. But I did it anyway. Um, and what my daughter said is she said, hey, I want you to give into my Facebook if you can hack in. Well, unfortunately, I used to work in tech and finance, so that was like a no-brainer. Um, there's a little device you just put up, and there's a little device you put under the keyboard or under the, the device in a place that they won't find, like in the battery compartment, and it'll transmit every little keystroke you want, every one they tap. So by the end of the weekend, I showed her exactly the keyboard, the passwords to multiple accounts, and I said, I can get in any time I want, but what I want you to do is to come to me if things go wrong. I don't want to hover over you. I want to make you develop the skills in that safe environment. So she started developing that trust and that, um, and if I found things that were uh, concerning, I wouldn't go zero in to that item. I would generally describe or generally express my concern as opposed to that specific thing. Because then that feels like, man, you're really zeroing in on me. And so then that means you would open up a little bit more. Uh, my son, I did the same thing, but unfortunately, he went down a different road, but uh, but, but he's doing well now. So, but, so snooping, yeah, um, but let them also develop some skills. So maybe the next one, maybe, oh, we have to start with Mark, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of quiet, but, so, you know, when things get tough, do you think, and then we'll hear from other people too, do you think it's okay for parents to call the police about their teen's behavior? Well, yeah. I'll also, referring back to the other question, the real easy thing about getting through a cell phone is get your kid on probation and tell the PO to do it. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, listen, you want to develop a rapport with your team. You 
want them to be open and honest with you, but above all, you need to keep them safe. Your kids are your responsibility. If they're doing something that is going to be a danger to themselves or to other members in the family or the community as a whole, absolutely call law enforcement. Um, but there's other things you can do as well. Uh, you know, you can solicit the assistance of professionals. Uh, that you, you know, you, any parent can get um, their child dialed into uh, a drug assessment, a substance abuse assessment. Um, so I highly encourage you to reach out to community organizations that can help you uh, kind of sift through that. Um, but yeah, if, and I deal this with a, as a probation officer all the time. Uh, we'll get calls from, from uh, you know, after hours calls or calls over the weekend from uh, parents and, and they're saying things like, you know, my, you know, my kid is, is throwing things through the wall. What do I do? Well, you call the police. Okay, that's, that's, that's a dangerous situation. If they're under the influence, you know, and that's the reason why they're doing it, well, we need to address that. And, and so, so the short answer, of course, is, is call the police when safety is an issue. I also want to say that at CORE, we work really closely with Placer County Juvenile Probation, and it is a wonderful team to have. Um, they're great people, as you can see how caring and thoughtful they are. Uh, I think that calling them brings extra support to your life, extra resources, extra support, and we have found it very helpful to have them as partners. Any other thoughts on that one, or? <laughs> okay, so so kind of getting into it. So, you know, as a parent of younger teens, what are some risk factors to look for for drug use or abuse? And this is kind of a three-part question. So really getting into it. So if my child is stressed or anxious, you know, what can I look for? What drugs might they be attracted to? And then what can I do to help manage that peer pressure or other influences? What can I do? What can I look for? What might they be doing? Okay, um, the biggest change I'd say would be more closed off, more secretive about everything. Because when you're hiding something, you know, you, as a parent, you can tell. So look for that. Um, sometimes it's not as obvious as other times, but just be aware. Try to see what your kids are doing because when I started, I. I went from being friendly to being by myself most of the time. I didn't want to be around anybody. I don't want anyone to find out what I was doing. So that's one thing I always did. Um, you said stress and anxious and what you're doing? Yeah, kind of are there specific drugs or what will it, what kind of peer pressures will they be facing? Um, it depends, but you know, everyone wants to fit in, everyone wants to be cool. And sometimes drugs go with that. It's all up to the kids whether you said yes or no, but just be yourself pretty much. Try to promote that because if you want to fit in, then most likely your kid might do drugs trying to fit in with some people. Um, what I would uh, say the first thing that you would start to notice with your kid is um, basic behavioral things. Um, for me, it was having issues at school, and then it was not going to school, and failing out of school. And um, the thing is, is, you don't want to notice when it's already too late. Um, you don't want them to already be deep down into it, and have been like, wow, I didn't even know. Um, you want to start catching these little things before it gets worse, and um, talking to them about it, and asking them why they're doing it. Uh, that's, yeah, that's why I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. I like what you said, but um, one of the things you talked about early prevention, and I hear it in a lot of our teens, is like, hey, my parents wait up for me when I get home at night, um, but we had not made it. We ran upstairs and they didn't know I was high, or they didn't know I was drunk, um, but they just waited for me to get home. And sometimes it's, um, like you said, early snooping, 
uh, but just waiting when they come home and have that conversation. <coughs> How was the party? Were you okay? And um, I think that's an early sign is having that um, that conversation as soon as they get there. And you'd be able to tell if someone had been drinking or they were using that day. Um, and most of the time, I think of, we've had a couple um, people I say like, "Wow." I tripped up the stairs. I didn't know that my parents knew. I swore I was going to get caught that day, um, but they didn't notice. And sometimes I wonder if we were just afraid to just ask that question. I think that's perfect. I mean, you definitely be um, aware and do ask. Uh, it's that conversation. It's not that conversation as a one-off. It's a continuing conversation. Um, I know that uh, when I was a kid, and I remember one time I drank a little bit too much. And, um, but my dad's a carpenter, and so I, the next day I had to get up. So he, he waited up, and, and he asked me, hey, you see him a little bit off, you could be able to get up to work. And, um, and I said, yeah, and of course he smelled the breath. I said, you know what, you gotta want to stay off that stuff. He didn't have to say more, that's all he did. It's just, you want to stay off that stuff. But you better believe it, 5.30, I was up, no matter what. Uh, so holding them accountable is the other thing. Be mindful of holding them accountable. And then maybe you can also address that peer pressure piece. So, I mean, it was part of this question, but I haven't heard it yet. So when their friends are saying, come on, please do this, or that idea that everybody's doing it, and even though I show them the data, like, not everybody's doing it. She's like, everybody's doing it, Mom. How do we, what do we do there? I think the most, the best thing you can do is make them as strong as they can be in terms of their belief in themselves, their belief in their future, their belief in their goals, help, hopeful um, that they have the ability to achieve. Once kids get, what I see is when, once kids feel not connected to their parents, not connected to their families, not connected in their school, and they feel like I'm never going to achieve anything, nobody believes in me, uh, I think you open them up to peer pressure because they want to have a place where they're accepted and belonged. And believe me, doing drugs together is very much a place where you're accepted and belong. So you have to create that for them in the home, I believe, and in their, their trust and belief in themselves and in their future and in their goals. I don't know if I have too much more to add except for just to highlight the fact that uh, I can tell you how many kids I've sat across the table from and have told them I can predict your future just by knowing who you hang out with. Um, so as a parent, be cognizant of who your kids are associating with. In the formation world, the community corrections world, we call the positive peer relationships. You want to drive home the fact that to your kids, and what I try to do to, to uh, youth on probation is if you want to be successful, you have to surround yourself with people that are successful and going in the same direction you are. Uh, if you're going to tell me on one side of your mouth that you're trying to be uh, clean and sober, or on the other side of the mouth you're sneaking out and hanging out with the guys that do that kind of stuff, well, you know, you're not walking the talk and you've got an issue with the, with the peer relationship. So really pay attention to who they're hanging out with. My teenage daughter, she's got a friend that's kind of quirky and weird, but she's on the soccer team and doing all kinds of other things right. So I always encourage her to keep hanging out with her, you know, even though she's kind of loud and obnoxious when she's in the house with me, but, you know, um, so, and that's okay. Um, I'll take that versus some of the other kids she could be hanging out with. So just pay attention to that and be willing to have some of those fierce conversations um, with your youth. And, and, and again, you don't want to attack them. Um, you know, the best approach is just to let them know, hey, I'm just concerned and, and uh, I want us to be honest with each other and, and, uh, you know, just talk about what's going on. I agree. I'm sorry. But, um, I absolutely agree. We have to let them know. I think that um, the trend here is listening and having that open communication with your child and letting them know that they can come and talk to you if they're having those issues with some friends. Um, and I think we said again in the beginning was um, listening to them, being open to what they have to say so that they're able to come to us and have that conversation. You know, my mom or my friend is smoking or I have some friends who are using, but it's just um, being able to have that conversation. And I like think you said earlier, is continuous conversation. 
So I think we're going to do kind of a last question, and we got a little late start, but um, so I think we're going to wrap it up with, so what I'd like to ask each of you in closing is if you can, um, any closing thoughts that you have that maybe you didn't get brought up that would be important to share, as well as where can people go for help, what are some resources, and um, and for, for you guys, if you could even share maybe some of the, the either local resources or strategies that work for you, and we could just go um, maybe down the line. So sort of closing thoughts and resources. I think as much as you can involve your team in the solutions to the problem, so that it's not saying, do this, I want you to do that, or this is, I'm concerned about your phone, I'm gonna take it away, but really, our job is a teacher and a mentor, and what we are teaching them is how to think things through, how to make decisions, pros and cons, what's the solution, what's this, how to solve the problem. So sitting down with them and rather than saying do this, say, what are your ideas? This is what I need out of it. I want to hear what you need out of it. And I want to see where we can meet and come up with a good plan that satisfies both of us. And teaching them that skill is a skill they're going to have forever, I think. Um, and for resources, one resource I want to mention if you're Concern. I mean, obviously you have resources back here. You're living in a wonderful community with some great resources. Um, there's also NAMI, which is a National Association of the Mentally Ill, and it's a wonderful support organization for uh, parents who have children who are struggling with really high levels of stress or anxiety or depression, and you can look up where, the, where they meet in the area, and I think that's a great resource, and don't ever be afraid to reach out for professional help for you and your family and your child. I would close by saying, or at least my final thought would be, um, as, again, as a probation officer in community corrections, I know a couple of things, one of which, uh, the Supreme Court has has determined that uh, youth uh, are are more are less culpable than adults. Okay, so that's the reason why we don't treat uh, in the juvenile probation world uh, juveniles as many adults. We understand that their brains haven't fully developed and all that, and um, that they tend to be uh, compulsive and they don't think about the long term effects and all that good stuff. But on on the on the other hand. Uh, youth are more capable, in my mind, than adults. Uh, so, listen, all of us have made, made mistakes in life. I'm still making mistakes. Um, nobody is perfect. Uh, but understand this as a parent, it's frustrating, you have to be patient, um, you have to be strong and committed, and, uh, uh, but understand that, that your kid can make it, okay? Kids are capable, they can be resilient, uh, you just have to uh, ensure that they have the support that they need and the framework that they need to be successful. Um, what I would say is uh, you need to let your kid know that you're there for them and that you're trying to help them and give them, be their support and instead of, you know, Kids commonly look at their parents as like, like the warden, like all they do is punish me, they won't be home at this time, it's like, it's like a jail, but if you let them know that uh, you're there for them and that you've been through similar things, then they're a lot less likely to, um, you know, re they're, they're gonna react better to that. Uh, oh, and also kids change when they are ready to change, I believe. Um, you can't force someone to change. You can, you can provide consequences and it might make them not do it, but they might still want to go out and do it, which is when, when they become 18 and about, they're just gonna go right back to what they were doing before, but just, you know, they don't have the consequences now. Um, you need to instill, instill in them that um, what they're doing is wrong, but uh, help them understand why it is um, and what they're doing is going to is, is going to damage them. Um, yeah. Um, 
I would absolutely agree. I would um, tell them and show them that you love them every day. Be a positive support to them. Um, and then that's all you can do really is let them know that you are there for them, to support them. Um, as resources go, I would say obviously core. Um, community care resources were back there. But um, the great thing is, is high schools and middle schools now have resource officers and um, social workers and therapists on staff that can provide you with some of the resources that you may know. Um, and it's out there. I know the, I don't want to name drop, but Whitney High School, I think, have reached out recently and, and they're starting a resource in Oakmont and um, Del Oro. So it's out there. You just um, have to look or um, rock with people and you can spend time with you too. Well, I wanted to for my four things in a row, but looking out at the audience, I want to add two more. One is the dads that are out there, later on, if these things get to be an addiction, like in my case it was, my son's a, um, a heroin addict. Um, he's also five years in recovery. He's also a valedictorian so, um, in college. So it can be managed if he manages it, as opposed to me doing it for him. So you, be, you being here and taking on this issue and being open about it is the right thing to do. Don't, don't hide it. Make it accessible to your kids so they can talk to you about it. Uh, the dads here, um, later on if you go to Al-Anon meetings, you will mainly see women. So for the dads, stay engaged. You dads, you will make a difference, but you've got to stay engaged. And now to the four things that I definitely wanted to tell you, and these came to me over about a 10 year, 15 year period. They didn't come all at one time and they didn't come this clearly, but so there's a little bit of pain in, in earning these, these lessons that, uh, that I want to, share with you. I want to share with you. First, addiction is a disease. If you look at the definition of what addiction is and you compare it to disease, it matches. It hits all the elements. It's a disease, so treat it like a disease. Two, um, if you um, if you seek when well, no, I'm not yet, excuse me. Two, seek help for the entire family because the entire family will be affected by drug abuse or drug addiction. Don't focus on just the individual having the drug abuse or drug addiction problem. Treat the whole family. Three, when you do get help, remember that it is a drug. Uh, uh, Addiction is a brain disease, so it's going to affect your perception, your judgment, your decision, and your actions. It's going to affect, it's a brain disease. It's affecting the whole family, including you. It's going to affect them, but your, um, your perceptions, judgment, decisions, and actions as well. So engage with people like for, um, I get to do some very gratified to get to do some volunteer work with them and great organization and there's great other organizations here get help from professionals so that not just that you're going to get better perception better judgment better decisions better actions better outcomes and that's what you want the better outcomes and so um, uh, the last one the last one is sort of uh, um, if you do find Number four, if you do find, and I hope you don't, but in my case I did, I found that uh, my son had an addiction. If that happens, don't deny it, don't reject it, accept it. Because if you accept it, you will start to do something about it. But if you reject it, if you deny it, you're never going to get treatment. And this thing doesn't get better without treatment. Get treatment, and at least you're going to have a better outcome. We were going to do a um, communications role play. We, I don't think we have time. I want to mention one book that if you read one, if you want to read one book on how to improve the communication with your teens, read how to talk to your teens so they will listen, how to listen to your teens so they will talk. It's short, it's powerful, and helps you break some patterns of talking to each other that can be very harmful. So we have a, some really good questions. I guess I just kind of want to gauge. Um, the audience because I, I think that we were meant to get out of here around 7.30. We will be putting all the questions up on the um, 
on the website for Raising Placer. We'll put them on our website as well, so we'll do written responses to them all. So, and my co-leaders, what do you guys think? Should we take a question or two, or do you want to really try to get out of here in two minutes? <laughs> and then we have to finish Alicia's, yeah. Keep moving. Do you guys want to stay a few more minutes and get through this, or? Um, um, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for being responsive. I want to be really respectful, but this is really great stuff, and so I appreciate that feedback. Okay. Um, so we'll do a couple questions and then the role play, and we'll just keep it moving quickly. Um, I think this is a really good one, or may relate. They're all good questions. This one might relate to a lot of folks. How do you address when your child has a friend, he or she is worried about drinking too much, and should I tell the other child's parents? So this is great, the child is talking to their mom or dad, saying, I'm, I'm a little worried about my friend, and mom or dad wants to keep that trust which they have, and what do they do? I actually want to hear from the teens what they do. Can you rephrase the question a little bit? So how do you address when your child has a friend that he's worried about drinking too much? So you're telling your mom, hey, my friend's drinking too much, I'm a little worried about him, and mom or dad is listening and wants to know what they should say and should they tell your friend's parents? I've been in this situation and I think, yes, um, that kid's in danger. You know, you're gonna be like, oh, uh, it's not my kid, I'm not gonna worry about it, but if they OD and die, that's on, that's on, not necessarily on your hands, but you could have, could have, you had a play in that, you know, and you didn't inform their parents, or uh, yeah, you didn't inform somebody what's going on because if you don't, it can get, it can get a lot worse. Something bad can happen. Awesome. Any other thoughts on that? In that case, you might approach the parents yourself and not attribute that comment to your your child, and just have been noticing these things so that way it doesn't come back to your child. And I think that's really good and comes back to what Nancy said at the beginning to educate yourself on what that might, what might the risks be. Make sure so that you can have a conversation and ask their child, ask your child what you think about, um, what they think about their friend drinking. What have they noticed? What are some of the risks? Then you can start to share some of that data that you know because you've educated yourself on those risks. Talk a little bit about the brain development. Talk a little bit about what those risks are and that you have been to this thing and you learned about um, you know, from a young person saying, wow, that kid is really in danger. I'm really glad you brought this to me. So being able to use that to share some of the information that you've educated yourself on. I think also it's a great opportunity to get to know who your um, kids' friends are and build a relationship with their family. So I think that's a difficult question and everybody might take it um, different. Do you know your kids' parents? Are you able to have a communication with that? Recently, I did have that situation happen with a daughter and my daughter and her friend, and it was hard because I didn't have that open relationship um, that I do with her daughter. So that was a step that, and I'm lucky that I get to do what I do, but have that conversation with her daughter, talk to her, engage with her, let her know that we were there, um, and encourage her to, to talk to her own parents about it. Um, so. I have a good kid, I don't think she's using, but how can I find out and how could I be sure? Drug test. <laughs> I think we were all going to say the same thing. <laughs> you just said. But and in fact, at CORE and I think some other agencies, you can buy easy dip tests to check. And, um, and what we tell our kids who are in our, our program, that we're not testing you to catch you using, we're testing you to catch you clean. I just want to reassure myself that everything's okay. Um, so I think it's absolutely okay to go ahead and test them and then watch for all the other signs that we've been talking about. I think teenagers can already, they're going through a pretty emotional developmental stage and I know my son, uh, just naturally became, I was listening to you, became a little more quiet, a little more isolated, like going to his room and playing video games. And so I just hung out in his room with him. I went in, I read a magazine while he played, and just being there 
it's not, it's quality, but it's also quantity. Um, just be there with them as much as you can will give you some great insight into how they're doing. Well, if your kid's always been pretty organized, you will notice that they're becoming a lot less organized. Um, dirtier rooms, um, sleeping habits obviously change a lot, um, eating habits, things that are every day that you, you know, things that are being thrown off that you are noticing. Um, just little things should be indicators. And yeah, your, yeah, you're definitely your eyes. If, if their eyes are red and they're coming home, their eyes are already passing out. Then that um, but yeah. Oh, clothing a lot. Um, a lot of clothing. Uh, I mean, you guys can do research. There's, there's a lot of clothing that represents um, marijuana use and a lot of different stuff. And uh, some people say, oh, it's just, you know, it's just clothes, but they're kind of supporting it if they're wearing it. Um, so. And smell, smell your kids' stuff. It's really, it is a hard to smell the mask. Um, yeah. A lot of good tips, thank you. Um, so maybe we'll do one more question on the role play. So, um, why has the term substance abuse changed to substance use? We've also used the term substance use disorder, so someone picked up on that. There may be more research behind this than I'm aware of, but I think it's changed because any use is abuse. That you have to be, sometimes people think, oh, they just use once, or it's a one-time experiment, and that is never a justification for ignoring it, denying it, or letting it go. That is an opportunity for you to step in, talk about your values, take the first steps um, towards helping. So. I think abuse made it sound like it had to get pretty bad before we did anything, but actually any use is something, particularly in teens who are um, impulsive and, and risk takers, that any use is a dangerous use. Okay, we are gonna do the role play. Um, so we have a couple uh, scenarios for you to see, and. The reason we did this is um, because I think as families, we do get into very harmful ways of interacting with each other, that the parents get in the habit of saying, why did you do that? That was really stupid. What made you make that decision? And what's the kid's reaction? Leave me alone. Shut up. Go away. And to break those harmful types of interaction is our duty as a parent and to understand how to listen genuinely, listen openly, listen honestly, that if you hear them, they'll be more likely then to listen to you. Um, so I think our first one was Stephanie, yes, and Jacob. So um, my daughter's 15 tomorrow, but one of the things, because um, I want to be a better mom, just like we were at work and um, in our relationships, and um, a few years ago, I was like, hey, a little jealous, sorry, I was a little jealous because um, my mom and my daughter's relationship was very close, and I was like, gosh, I want that relationship, um, and again, timing, her and I were driving home one day, and a question that I asked her, and I guess I was fearful to hear it, but I remember saying, like, how can I be a better mom to you? So, Jacob, if I was your mom, how could I be a better mom to you? That's a difficult question to ask, but it's, it's there's simple answers. Um, and one of them is, is letting your kid know that um, you are there for them, and that you do love them and care for them. Um, and making them feel open to you, like, and, and welcome to you. Um, establish a comfortable environment, environment for them to be at, um, like their room or the house, make it feel like home to them. 
Um, there's nothing worse than a kid that, that doesn't have a home, that doesn't feel like they have a home. Um, you, know, uh, you know, parents will, will, will lie and tell their kids that, you know, I was a good kid, I was a golden child. Well, I'm not gonna wanna open up to anybody that about my, my use if they've never used them. I'm not gonna go talk to somebody about cars that is not interested in cars. Um, you know, you need to let them know that they're not the only one, like, uh, that you've been through it too. Um, if they need space, if, if they want space, give them space, don't give them too much space because then trouble can happen, but, um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to nag your kid and, t like, force them to tell you what is going on. Um, they'll open up to eventually. You just gotta, like I said, let them know and that you're there and let them open up to you. Um, but yeah. That wasn't really role play, but sorry. <laughs> We're going to do a little bit of role play for you. A um, couple things that maybe just throw out there so maybe you can kind of see that we'll be using. One is that um, I'm not going to confront. Um, as soon as you confront, they start shutting down. You don't want to do that, so you don't want to confront. Um, the second thing is, and this is huge, this may seem not quite seem like it, but it is monumental. Don't judge. Just don't judge. 